don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. Hey, man. Welcome back. We are going to continue the 2013 AP Calculus AB practice exam that College Board gave us. Um, this is the second video, so we are going to do multiple choice questions 11 through 20 in section 1, part A. A calculator may not be used on this part of the exam. Yada, yada, yada. We're smart. We're cool. We don't need that calculator. Let's get going. Number 11. Let f be the function defined by f of x equals the integral from 0 to x of 2x cubed minus 15x squared plus 36. I'm saying x, but they're t's. t dt. All right? On which of the following intervals is the graph of y equals f of x concave down? Bing bong, first light that should go off. Concavity means the second derivative. If it's concave down, my second derivative should be negative. All right? They give us, to start, f of x equals the integral from 0 to x of 2t cubed minus 15t squared plus 36t. And don't forget that little dummy variable. I love them. I love them so much. All right? Let's start by finding the first derivative. I got to take the derivative of f of x, which means I take the derivative of my integral, which is nice for me because derivatives and integrals, they go bye-bye. And when the integral goes bye-bye, I'm so sad, the dummy variable goes bye-bye too. He's my friend. Okay? So I am now going to take this variable, x, and put this in for every t. So my first derivative of f of x is 2x cubed minus 15x squared plus 36x. I need the second derivative, which means, once again, I need to take the derivative of the first derivative. My second derivative is, okay, the derivative of 2x cubed is 6x squared. Minus the derivative of 15x squared is 30x, plus the derivative of 36x is just 36. Now, how do I know where my second derivative is negative or positive? I need to find my points of inflections first. That is the x values where my second derivative is equal to 0. So factoring never goes away. First, let's make this real easy. Let's divide a GCF of 6 out of both sides. x squared minus 5x plus 6 still equals 0. Now, two numbers that multiply to be positive 6 that add to negative 5, that seems like negative 3 and negative 2. And it is. All right? Well, now I do something that I like to say is T-boning here. And I take x minus 3, set it equal to 0, and x minus 2, set it equal to 0. And those two x values will be x equals 3 and x equals 2. These are the values that make my second derivative equal to 0. That is where my points of inflection are. So what I'm going to do here now is draw a number line. My second derivative will be on the top, my x values on the bottom. I know at 2 and at 3, my second derivatives are 0. Okay? So let's start picking points uh, on the outsides and in between. All right. Let's pick uh, x equals 0. That's nice. And I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it into the factored version of my second derivative. So this is still my second derivative. It's just factored. And I'm going to put the 0 in for the x's. So it's 0 minus 3 times 0 minus 2. So I get negative 3 times negative 2. That's a positive 6. I don't care so much about the 6. I care about this. My second derivative, which means my concavity, is positive in this interval right here because my second derivative is positive. 
That's a plus, not an X. It's just sideways, a positive six. All right, let's pick a number on the other end. I don't know, let's pick four. And we're going to put it into the same factored version of my second derivative, that yellow highlight. So it is 4 in for the x minus 3 times 4 in for the other x minus 2. That's going to be a positive 1 times a positive 2. That will also be a positive answer. I don't care about the 2. I just care that it's positive. So if my second derivative is positive here, so is my concavity. These are both smiley faces. They concave up. Oh, boy. Let's check in between. Let's pick 2.5. Okay, and let's put, I will do this in another color, I'll do this in orange. Uh, let's put 2.5 in for these x's. Okay, so it's 2.5 minus 3 times 2.5 minus 2. This is negative 0.5 times a positive 0.5. A negative times a positive will be a negative. That'll actually be 0.25, but I don't care about this so much. I just care that it's negative. So in between here, is where my concave down is. That's in between 2 and 3. And if I look here, choice D, in between 2 and 3 only. Number 12, for which of the following does the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equal 0? And they give us three options for f of x. And we're going to see, is it one of them? Is it two of them? Uh, it shouldn't be all three of them. That's not an option, our A, B, C, D, and E. It's either going to be one, it's either only going to be two, or it's only going to be three, or it's one and two, or it's one and three. It is not all three of them. Oh, man, this is just a basic thing. This is before you learn derivatives and we're going over limits. All right? In order for a fraction, which is what all three of these things are, which that helps, okay? In order for a fraction to approach zero when you plug infinity in for x, the bottom of the fraction, the denominator, has to grow faster than the numerator, okay? If the bottom of the fraction gets big and the top stays small, the overall value of the fraction will look so small that we say it approaches zero, okay? So if I have 1 over 1, that's 1. 1 over 10, that's 0.1. 1 over 100, that's 0.01. And you can see if I... Thousandths, that's a hundredth, that's a thousandth. That's a tenth, hundred thousand. Yeah, I'll be okay. I'm losing my mind. But the number gets smaller and smaller. Eventually, it would approach zero. All right? So let's take a look at these and understand something right here. Number one, if you aren't sure which one of those grows faster, you can just think of their graphs. All right? If I were to graph the ln of x, eh, it kind of looks something like that. That's the ln of x. If I were to graph x to the 99, that shoots up like this, x to the 99. This right here grows a lot faster. It goes up higher quicker than ln of x. So the bottom does grow faster here. This is good. We like that. That would approach 0 because the denominator gets bigger quicker. All right? Number two. If I were to graph these things here, the ln of x, again, I mean, it looks something like this. It, it increases, but slowly. e to the x, that thing goes, boom, e to the x, okay? ln of x. Obviously, e to the x grows much faster than ln of x. So the top grows faster, not the bottom. That would actually approach infinity, not zero. So it can't be two. It can't be this one or this one. So it's either one or one and three. Rule of thumb. Okay, you look how I, I graphed x to the 99 and e to the x. They kind of almost look the same. Here's the kick when it comes to variables. If I have a variable that's a base, Okay, it's a, it's a number that's bigger than 1. And the exponent is positive. It will grow. It will increase. But if I have a number bigger than 1 as a base, e is 2.7, whatever, 1, 8, whatever, and my variable is the exponent, 
exponents grow faster than bases do. Okay, so the bottom will grow faster here than the top. This is good. So my choice is one and three. Okay, so that little nugget, exponents grow faster than bases, considering they're positive and bigger than one. That's a good thing to know. Number 13, let f be a differentiable function such that f of 0 is negative 5. That, in my brain, tells me that's a coordinate. 0, negative 5. Okay, so this is a given. And what else is given is that f prime of x, the derivative, which is also the slope, is 3 or less. So the slope is less than or equal to 3. That means my slope can be 3, 2, 1, 0. It could be negative, I don't know, negative 4, whatever. Da, da, da. It can never be 4. It can never be 5. It's 3 or smaller, my slope. Okay? Which means I could have a slope of 3. There's a slope of 3. A slope of 2. A slope of 1. A horizontal one. A negative one. It doesn't matter. But I will never have a slope bigger than 3. No, 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 no. It'll never increase like that. Okay? And that's important to understand because I'm going to give you a visual for this. Of the following, of the following, which is not, that's a big word here, kids, a possible value for f of 2. Again, when I say f of 2, this is an x value. Okay, so which one of these things up here cannot be the y here? So when x is 2, could y be negative 10? I don't know. When x is 2, can we get negative 5? When x is 2, could I get a y of 0? When x is 2, could I get a y of 1? And when x is 2, could I get a y of 2? So one of these cannot possibly happen. Let's graph what we know so far. Here's my y-axis. And here's my x-axis. So Bam. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. I'm going to graph what they gave me here. This is a given. 0, negative 5 is this dot right here. Okay, that is 0, negative 5. Okay, at most, our very, our, our, our biggest increase, our steepest slope is 3. So I'm actually going to plot a line with a slope of 3. All right, which means we need, okay, let's go 1, 2, and let's go up. One, two, three. All right. So let's go from my zero five up three, one, two, and over one. That's this dot here. That's at one, negative two. Now let's go up three again. One, two, three, and over one. There we go. That's at the point two, one. Okay, now let's go up three again. One, two, three, and over one. Ooh, I didn't even put that line. That would be at 3, 4, okay? That would be at 4, at 3. Okay, and I've got this line, and I'm going to connect it with this green line right here. That is the biggest slope. Again, that's the biggest. Every other slope can be less steep. It can be horizontal, or it can be negative. But it can't be more steep, which means I will do this in orange. I can have a line through 5 a little less steep, like this, like this, like this, it could be horizontal, it could be negative, but it can never be this, okay, in blue. It can never be more than three. It, it, that's impossible because at most our slope is three. Let's look at all the possible y values when x is two. Okay, this is the most it can be, or it could be any value on this dashed line, okay, depending on what my slope is. It can't be anything up here because my slope isn't bigger than 3. All right? So it could be 1. That's the most it could be. This is the biggest value it can be. It could be 0. It could be a point right here. Okay? It could be negative 5. It could be right here if I have a horizontal line, a slope of 0. Okay? Or if I have a negative slope, it could be negative 5 or negative 10. It could be way down here. But it can never be bigger than this. It can never be 2. We can never have that because I don't have a slope steeper than 3 that will put my dot right here. If I wanted to put my dot right here, this dot that I'm drawing in blue right here, I would have to have a slope 
that would come up from five and go through that. But in order to have that slope like that, it would have to be bigger than three. And I can't have that based on what they gave. Number 14, I, I mean, I like it. It's kind of one of those rare oddball problems. There's a, there's a handful of them in this group, 11 through 20. But uh, 14 is a good problem, but it's rare. Um, if you didn't understand it, hopefully you will after we do it. Right? 14 says, let f be the function given above, and we have a piecewise function. Um, when x is less than or equal to 1, x plus b is the function we use. When x is greater than 1, we use ax squared. So what are all values of a and b for which f is a differentiable at x equals 1? Okay, first of all, if I have something that's not like, uh, if it's piecewise, it's in parts, okay, and it connects at 1. Remember, if it's differentiable, it has to be continuous, so it does connect at x equals 1. Okay, it has to be. If it's differentiable, it's continuous. I want to see, okay, what are all values for a and b for which f is differentiable? I'm finding, I'm saying that it is differentiable, so it is continuous. The derivative from the left side has to be equal to the derivative from the right side. If x equals 1 is right here, okay, and I have a slope that's different than the slope here, that's a quarter. That's not differentiable, okay? So in order for it to be differentiable, at this point 1, the same slope from the left has to be the same slope. Uh, yes, yeah, same slope. The same slope from the left, it has to be the same as the slope from the right. Because when I zoom in here, it has to look like a straight line. All right? So let's set the derivatives from the left and right side equal. So the derivative from this side, which is left of 1, has to equal the derivative of this side, which is to the right of 1. Let's begin our work. Mm, green. The derivative of my left side has to equal the derivative of my right side. All right? So remember, A and B, those are values. Those are constants. Derivatives of constants are zero. So the derivative of X is 1 plus the derivative of B is zero. That's 1. The derivative of ax squared, the 2 comes down in front, times ax, and then I reduce the exponent by 1. So it's really 2ax. All right, so how is this going to help me solve for a? Because I have two unknowns. But do I have two unknowns? Remember, I want this at an x value of 1. So really I have 1 equals 2 times a times 1 which is really 1 equals 2a, because a times 1 is a. Let's just divide by 2, and now 1 half is my a. Okay, I've got an a value. That's sweet. That's good. a is 1 half. Maybe it's a. a is 1 half. Maybe it's choice b. a is 1 half. Maybe it's c. Um, e, there is no such values. There are no such values. Um, yeah, any real number... That's probably not going to work, so I'm going to cross that off right now. All right. So, uh, we can come back to that later if you're like, why? Why not? Okay, let me explain, guys. Let me explain. A, but I don't have my B. Remember, kids, when I said if it's differentiable, it also has to be continuous? Well, in order for something to be continuous, doesn't the limit from the left side have to equal the limit from the right side? It does. Okay. So now I set the derivatives equal to find my A. Now I'm going to set the limits equal from the left and right to find my B. And that's all because if it's differentiable, it's also continuous. All right. The limit as I approach X equals 1 from the left side of x plus b, because that's the left side, needs to equal the limit as x approaches 1 from the right side, which is ax squared. The easiest way to solve a limit is to plug it in. So let's plug our 1 in for x here. So it's 1 plus b equals, let's plug our 1 for our x here. 
a times 1 squared. And we'll clean it up. So we got 1 plus b equals a. Um, I still have two unknowns. Or do I? We know a has to be 1 half because the derivatives are equal. a has to be 1 half. So let's substitute 1 half in for that a. So I've got 1 plus b equals my a, which is 1 half. Let's subtract 1 from both sides. So b equals 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Oh, so now we have an a and a b. Oh, oh glory be, that's fantastic. Right here. Now, I said you can come back and check this. Um, no, A has to be 1 half. It has to be 1 half. That means this will not work. If I start plugging in random numbers into the function they gave me, I will find that that does not work. Okay? We have A is 1 half, B is negative 1 half, just like this. And if we went back and started checking some numbers in the original function, that would never work, no way, no how. All right? In fact, if you don't believe me, let's pick a number. No, 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 no. I hate having to prove everything, dang it. But maybe it's because I'm OCD or something along those lines. Okay, well, uh, we had A was 1 half and B was negative 1 half, which means this would work, right? But uh, I don't know. And we actually even came up with right here, as we were solving for B, this, which is this. Which means if A was 2... Shouldn't B be 1? That's how it should work. But if A was 2, guess what? If A was 2, our derivatives wouldn't be equal, would they? A has to be 1 half of those derivatives to be equal. So that's why it cannot work for any real number for B. All right? Oh, sorry, I, I had to say it. I had to, someone was going to ask the question, so I had to say it. 15, the table above, have I told you how much I love tables yet? Gives values for the function of f and g and their derivatives all at x equals 3. Thank you, table. Let k be the function given by k of x equals f of x divided by g of x, where g of x cannot be 0. Ugh, obviously, duh, it's a denominator. It can't be 0. What is the value of k prime of 3. That is really the derivative of k at an x value of 3. So let's first find the derivative of k. The derivative of k is, we have a fraction. All right, I, uh, I have this little rhyme. Here's the low part, the denominator. Here's the high part, the numerator. It goes low d high minus high d low. I draw a line and I square below. It's a rhyme. It has to rhyme. If you don't say it like that rhyme, and it doesn't rhyme, then the order's not correct. And that's important for the numerator because in subtraction, order matters. So let's start filling in what we got here. Low, which is g of x, times d high, the derivative of up here, is f prime of x, minus high, high, just as it is, which is f of x, times d low, the derivative of below is just g prime of x. I draw my line and I square whatever's below. I square the whole thing. All right. Now I want this. Oh, I'm going to be lazy here, kids, and I'm sorry. I want this at x equals 3. So I'm just going to write, okay, if I want this at 3, all of these are going to be 3s. And this is my lazy part. I'm just writing a 3 over all these x's. Okay. And now, now I've got to refer to my table to fill in all of those. So g of 3 is 2. 2 times f prime of 3 is 5. Minus f of 3, which is negative 1, times g prime of 3, which is negative 2 all over 
g of 3, which again is 2, squared. All right, well, this is fun. We got 10 minus, oh, that's a positive 2, all over 4. So if 8 over 4, which is 2, done and done. Thank you, Mr. C. The answer is 2. Number 16. If y equals 5x times the square root of x squared plus 1, then the derivative of y with respect to x, or dy dx, at x equals 3 is another straightforward derivative problem. The last one was the quotient rule, and this one's the product rule with the chain rule. Ooh, they ain't giving us anything easy, are they? I mean, it's, it's easy, but it's, it's not easy. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this. y equals 5x times, that's x squared plus 1 to the 1 half, okay? It's easier to take derivatives when you have exponents. So I'm going to change my square root to an exponent of 1 half. All right, so it is the first. Okay, this is the derivative of y, or dy dx, I should say, okay, because that's what they gave me here. First, times the derivative of the second. The derivative of this, the exponent comes down. The inside stays the same. I subtract 1 from my exponent, so it goes from positive half to negative half. Then I multiply times the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. Whew. First times derivative of the second. Plus the second, just as it is, times the derivative of the first. And the derivative of 5x is just 5. Okay, uh, I always tell my kids, okay, and I want this at x equals 3. And when I say my kids, my students, and my own kid, my son, I tell them, you know, if you don't have to simplify, don't do it. If you've got a number to plug in for x, just plug it in. The only reason I'm going to simplify here is because I'm literally going to cancel out a top and bottom. And I'm going to change my one-halves back to square roots because it's going to be easier to understand as we're going through it. Okay? So what can I cancel on the left side? The two on the bottom or the two on the top? Okay? This is technically over one now. I need to, anything with a negative exponent, this needs to come down. So the exponent can be positive. All right? So I have 5x times x here. That gives me 5x squared all over the square root of x. Um, well, it's going to be the square root. So for those of you that, that don't understand how that's going to be the square root, let me just do this first. Uh, x plus x squared plus 1 to so the positive 1 half. Okay, so my negative exponent turns positive. Now, I'm going to turn my 1 half exponent back to a square root. Okay, because when I plug my x in there, it's going to be easier to see that math unfold. Now, I have my 5 on the top. Okay, it's 5. And this is going to stay in the top too. This exponent is positive. So I'm just going to just change that back to a square root. And I want this at x equals 3. All right. Let's do some magic. No, good to gray. So there's going to be a 3 in for every x. 5 times 3 squared in my numerator over the square root of 3 squared plus 1 in my denominator plus 5 times the square root of 3 squared plus 1. Okay. Okay, I see what's happening here. Uh, the top, that's going to be 9 times 5, that's 45, over 9 plus 1 is 10 under the square root, plus 5, this is the same thing, the square root of 10. Uh, I don't think they have us simplify that anymore. They don't, okay? 45 over the square root of 10, plus 5 times the square root of 10, okay? Choice D right there in your face. 17. If the limit as h approaches 0 of arc sine of a plus h minus the arc sine of a all over h equals 2, which of the following could be the value of a? Dag nabbit, if you don't know, this is the definition of a derivative. 
This side here is how we found derivatives before we learned the power rule, the chain rule, the product rule, the quotient rule. Before we learned all of those shortcuts, this is how we found derivatives. All right? And the original function, okay, the original function is always this function here that follows the subtraction sign. What do I mean? If I had x squared, and I was going to use this, it would be x plus h squared minus x squared all over h. This is what I would do. This first part is where I put the x plus h in. The second part is always the original equation. So my original equation here is the arc sine of a. And what they want from us, what value do we put in for a so that it equals 2? So the derivative of arc sine, please, please, please know that arc sine of x is the inverse of sine of x, okay? I think they state that like in one sentence in a paragraph before you even start the test, or maybe even in directions. But arc sine is the same thing as the inverse of sine. And the derivative of this is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So if we're asking us to find the derivative of arc sine or the derivative of sine inverse, which is this, what value of a, or in our case, we put an x here, would make it equal to? So we are doing basic algebra to this right here. The trig has gone bye-bye. That arc sine, that limit is h, it's all gone bye-bye. So I have 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared equals 2. All right, well, let's put this over 1. We can cross multiply. 1 times 1 is 1 equals 2 times the square root of 1 minus x squared. We're going to divide both sides by 2. So I have 1 half equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. Let's now square both sides to get rid of that square root. Oh, I almost drew my 2 there. And 1 half squared is 1 fourth equals, this goes bye bye with this, 1 minus x squared. Let's keep on trucking. Uh, let's um, subtract 1. Okay, that's negative 3 fourths. 1 fourth, 1 quarter minus 1 is negative 3 quarters equals negative x squared. And if I wanted to, I can multiply both sides by negative 1. So that now. We have positives. All right. And now in order to solve x, I'm just going to take the square root one more time. Put this over here. The x, because this square root and this square cancel, equals the square root of 3 over 4, which is the square root of 3 over the square root of 4, uh, which is the square root of 3 over 2. Whew. Square root of 3 over 2. Look at that. Well, you look at that, kids. It's choice B. 18. If the ln of 2x plus y equals x plus 1, then dy dx is. We just got to take the derivative of this. Don't try and get fancy and isolate y. Uh, take the derivative implicitly. Meaning, anytime I take the derivative of x, it's business as usual. Anytime I take the derivative of y, I take the derivative of y like it's an x, but I need to write dy dx next to it. And that's ultimately what we're going to solve for. And, uh, man, what a hodgepodge of problems they got here. This is a tough little test. Okay, let's start. Uh, first of all, I'm going to rewrite this bad boy. The ln of 2x plus y equals x plus 1. All right, let's just take the derivative of both sides. Let's go right across the board. The derivative of ln is 1 over whatever the inside is, 2x plus y, times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of 2x is 2, plus the derivative of y is 1, but it's 1 dy dx, okay, equals... The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of 1 is 0. Bye-bye, constant. Bye-bye. All right, so now I'm just really going to 
get dy dx alone. All right. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I got you. So here we go. So at this point, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2x plus y. 2x plus y. And now I've got 2 plus dy dx equals 2x plus y. And the last thing, all right, this works out nice. I subtract 2. I subtract 2. So my derivative is 2x plus y minus 2. That's choice B. That actually wasn't too bad. Look at us go. Number 19, you vixen you. Look at that curvy graph. Number 19, the figure above shows the graph of the function g and the line tangent of the graph of g at x equals negative 1. That is our point right there. Let h be the function given by h of x equals e to the x times g of x. What is the value of h prime of negative 1? Well, the first thing we need to do here is let's find the derivative of h, and then we'll plug in the negative 1. Okay, so we're basically finding the derivative of h at x equals negative 1. This is h. Product rule. It is the first times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of g to the x is g prime of x. Plus the second, just as it is, times the derivative of the first. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. I think that should be like second nature by now, right? And this is h prime of x. Here we go. We're doing good. Now we need, okay, this one. We need a negative 1 in for all these x's. Okay, let's go to work. e to the negative 1 times g prime of negative 1 plus g of negative 1 times e to the negative 1. Well, my friends, negative exponents need to flip. Mm. Mm. So if this is over 1 and this is over 1, this is going to come down and my negative 1 exponent will become a positive 1 exponent. Same thing with this. So let's, uh, we'll do it over here, rewrite it. g prime of negative 1 over e to the positive 1. I don't have to write that exponent. Okay, plus g of negative 1 over e to the 1 as well. And I could probably combine those. Okay, let's do that. And I say probably. So whatever g prime of negative 1 is, I'm going to add that to g of negative 1. Okay, and when I add fractions with similar denominators or the same denominator, that denominator stays the same. All right? So I got to find out what g prime of 1 is and what, excuse me, g prime of negative 1. And I need to find out what g of negative 1 is. Okay, here we go. This line is g of x. So I need g of negative 1 and then I need g prime of negative 1. Well, this first one is just a coordinate. When x is negative 1, my y is 3. So g of negative 1 is 3. So let's go down here. g of negative 1 is 3. So I'm adding that to whatever g prime of negative 1 is. Okay, this is the slope, the m value, or the slope at x equals negative 1. It's a slope of g. M would be an equation of a line. So the slope, well, all I really got to do is find out the slope of this line right here. Uh, okay? And I have two coordinates. I have this one and this one. So why don't I just do a change in y over change in x? That would easily give me the slope. We'll call this x1 and y1, x2 and y2. So I have negative 3, which is y2, minus 3, which is y1. So it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. 
x2 is 0 minus negative 1. Okay, negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6. And any time I subtract a negative in the denominator, it's like adding. It's over 1. So negative 6 is my slope. So anywhere I have g prime of negative 1, I get to throw negative 6 in. Negative 6. So my numerator, negative 6 plus 3 is negative 3, all over my denominator of e. Woo! That's some good work. That is some good work. All right. Me gusta. Are you kidding me? Numbers 11 through 19 were bearish. 20 is so easy. It's cray cray. Now, whenever I take the derivative, I mean for x greater than 0, find the derivative of the integral from 0 to 2x of the ln of tq plus 1 dt. Whenever I take the derivative of an integral, these cancel and the dummy variable goes away. This term up here goes in for my t. Okay, so it's the ln of 2x cubed, because that's where my t is, was, plus 1. That's all in the parentheses. However, it's the chain rule times the derivative of whatever this upper bound is. The derivative of 2x is 2. All right, so let's just clean this up. I'll put my 2 out front, 2, the ln. If I cube 2, that gives me 8. If I cube x, that's x cubed, plus 1. Well, was, <laughs> you know, out of all the hard work we did there, it was nice to get a layout. And we are done. Thanks for hanging around. You know, follow me, like the video, leave a comment if you want to see other things done. I will see you when we do video three, which covers questions 21 through 28 without a calculator. Bye-bye. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.